Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this year's Office of Open Records annual training on the Right to Know Law and the Sunshine Act. Uh, my name is Eric Arneson. I'm executive director of the office. Uh, thrilled to have everybody joining us here uh, in person. We've also got several hundred people uh, joining us by webinar, so thank you to everybody uh, on the webinar as well. And also very much uh, a thank you to Commonwealth Media Services for all their help today and to PCN uh, for airing this live, and they'll rerun it uh, at least one more time as well. Uh, as I said, this is the OOR's annual training, but we do hold many trainings throughout the year. We've been on the road a lot this year as usual, uh, and by we, I mostly mean our tireless chief of training and outreach, George Spies, uh, but this year we've also hosted more webinars than ever before, and we have one coming up on Tuesday. Uh, that deals with payment issues and the right to know law. Uh, if you're interested in that or our other webinars, you'll find all the information on our website under the training calendar. Uh, we're also preparing to record a whole new set of videos for YouTube's uh, short focused segments that will touch on various areas of the right to know law and the Sunshine Act. Uh, hopefully those will be available starting early next year. And you'll hear more about this later, uh, but we've spent a lot of time lately working with the Legislative Data Processing Center to build a new public portal to improve the right to know law appeal process and also to make it more transparent. Uh, I have one statistical note I'd like to share here at the outset. Uh, the OOR is on track to have its second busiest year ever in 2019. We've had more than 2,000 appeals filed during the first 10 months of the year. And appeals filed in September and October have been significantly above the three-year average uh, for those two months. Uh, and so far, things have not slowed down at all in November. I don't think we're going to, I hope we don't get to be the busiest year because that was, that, that was, there was one outlier year. Uh, and that would make November and December ridiculously busy. But we are uh, on track to have it be the second busiest year. And finally, for me, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first, if you're an attorney, this session does qualify for two CLEs, so be sure to complete the appropriate form so that you get those credits. Uh, if you're here in person, you should have received a form when you checked in. If you are on the webinar, uh, you will be emailed a link to the form when the training session is over. Uh, we're going to have presentations today by our Director of Training, George Spies, Chief Counsel Charles Brown, and General Counsel Deline Lance. After that, we're going to leave a good amount of time for questions and answers. Uh, if you're here in the room, you should have index cards. Please write any questions you have on the index cards. Uh, Dylan from our office will be around periodically to collect those. Uh, we will wait until the very end to answer all questions. So whether your question is about the first, second, or third part of the presentation, uh, we'll get to them at the end. And if you're watching this session via the webinar, uh, you can uh, send your questions to the email address that is on your screen now, openrecords at pa.gov. Uh, thank you again for joining us today, and now I will turn over the program to George Spies. Thank you, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to spend some time talking about uh, Pennsylvania's Sunshine Act, and uh, I want to start by clarifying that the, uh oh, slight technical issue here. Let's try and get this worked out real quick. Here we go. Okay, the, uh, the purpose of Pennsylvania's Sunshine Act is to uh, encourage public participation in meetings and ensure that all business of the government is taken under the light of day. Um, so th there are some significant uh, issues that I'm going to touch on today that more or less represent a, a top-level view. Uh, there are uh, certainly more details that we can cover in an extended session, but we have limited time today, so this is where we're at. And the first question that we generally get asked, and that should be asked when considering the Sunshine Act, is, uh, is it in fact a meeting? Does this gathering qu qualify as a meeting per the definition of the Sunshine Act? So the first question we want to answer is, is there a quorum of the board present, whether it be a council, uh, uh, township supervisors, school board, or whatever? Because uh, there has to be a quorum in order to 
deliberate and in order to uh, affect votes, which constitutes decision making. Um, under the Sunshine Act and subsequent court decisions, members can phone in to a meeting. Uh, however, there are some conditions. First, everyone present in the meeting needs to be able to hear that member who is phoning in, and the member needs to be able to hear everyone at the meeting. So typically, a conference call or Skype setup is sufficient. However, you could not have, for instance, one member physically present at the meeting with a phone to his ear relaying back and forth. That would not be sufficient. So, like I said, a speaker phone would work. Now, there is an exception to this, and this would be if you are a member of a borough council, because under Pennsylvania's borough code, a quorum must be present physically in order for it to be considered a meeting. Any members in addition to the quorum can phone in, but there must be a quorum physically present. And the same conditions apply as far as everyone being able to hear that member on the phone and the member being able to hear all the other members of the board on his or her phone. Then the next question that we need to answer is, is there deliberation taking place? And deliberation basically is discussion among the members of the board relative to the business at hand. Uh, you can have uh, discussion taking place um, that is uh, rather one-sided, which would be known as a work session, and we'll maybe talk about that if we have time. Uh, but essentially, deliberation would be defined as discussion that ultimately would lead to decision making on the part of the board. And any discussion among those members of the board would need to take place in a public setting. And then the next question would be, is there decision making? Essentially, are, is there a resolution to take action on behalf of the board? Typically, decision making is uh, uh, described by a vote. You know, it, they would take a vote on action for which they have been deliberating up to that point. Um, I want to caution any public officials on potential email meetings because we still hear about that, where uh, our office receives phone calls. We have no enforcement authority relative to the Sunshine Act but we are tasked with providing guidance and training on the act. So we will receive phone calls, both from public officials as well as members of the public who have concerns about, is the Sunshine Act being followed? And uh, just two weeks ago, I think, uh, I received a phone call where it was apparent that a borough was conducting meetings or deliberations and decision making via email. Obviously, that is not in a public setting, and that would be contrary to both the letter of the law and the intent of the Sunshine Act. Um, even if you have less than a quorum involved in an email conversation, as soon as that conversation gets shared with the full board or a, a quorum of that board, you have entered into uh, deliberations by a quorum of the board which should be taking place in a public setting. Email is not a public setting, obviously. Uh, we also had one instance, uh, so I don't want to alarm anyone too much, but I, I think it is important to mention this, where uh, it was a Facebook page, and it was a, actually a private Facebook page, well, uh, a, a public page administered by a private citizen, I think is the best description. However, this public ci uh, or this uh, private citizen uh, was involved with issues of the borough and concerned about it and would routinely post matters of public interest on the private Facebook page. Those comments and comments from other uh, members of the public drew interest of several public officials who then began commenting themselves on the private Facebook page. Ultimately, uh, a 
majority of the board became involved in the Facebook conversation and unknowingly then began deliberating. Uh, whether they realized it or not, that was in fact the case. So I just want to caution everybody who is concerned about the Sunshine Act, uh, beware of social media. Don't be scared of it because I think a lot of good is coming out of the use of social media and letting the public knowing what we're up to. We just need to be very careful about conversations that we enter into and our use of social media to ensure that we're not in violation of laws like the Sunshine Act. So what is not a meeting? And earlier I mentioned work sessions, and this would also include conferences and retreats. Uh, I think school boards are probably the best example uh, to show what a work session is and why it would not constitute a meeting under the definitions of the Sunshine Act. Uh, typically a school board will have a monthly business meeting where it's open to the public, uh, there is deliberation and there is decision making taking place uh, in the form of votes. However, oftentimes they will also have biweekly work sessions. The work sessions typically are for information gathering purposes where uh, typically school district staff, administrative staff, will present reports and updates on initiatives to the board. And there can be questions back and forth between individual board members and those administrative staff members. Uh, however, there cannot be discussion on the merits of what's being presented among the board members themselves because, again, then we enter into the world of deliberation. So two points to bring out uh, that help define what a work session is. The communication is primarily one way. It's staff to board uh, providing updates on, on initiatives and reports and so forth. And second, there is no deliberation among the board members uh, because obviously then you're into the world of, uh, of uh, public meetings and the Sunshine Act would apply. Uh, we have run across some school boards who will uh, essentially advertise the session as a work session. However, it's pre-advertised, um, the public is invited, and they in fact allow public comment. So the question comes up, is that a public meeting? Well, per the definition of the act, it is. However, the problem that we run into is that because it has been advertised as a work session rather than a business meeting or public meeting, from the public's perspective, there is the expectation that no business will take place, that no decisions will be made. So in essence, you're, you've thrown cold water on any interest in the, from the public to attend that meeting because they, it's their expectation that no business will be taking place. So I would caution boards from uh, taking any votes during a work session despite the fact, or what they call as a, a work session, despite the fact that they have met all of the other legal requirements that would allow them to have a public meeting because of that intent as far as the public is concerned. Uh, conferences, it's not unusual for a board to attend a conference uh, put on by an interest group or uh, uh, you know, some central organization uh, for purposes of educating the staff, uh, and that's fine. It's just that uh, board members, again, need to be careful about what it is they discuss as members of a board when they're attending these conferences. If, again, you get a majority of a board together in a corner or uh, a side room, and uh, they're discussing the merits of a presentation as it relates to an issue that they have before their own board, they're deliberating. And uh, that would be contrary to the Sunshine Act, so they need to be careful about that. And same way with retreats. Uh, oftentimes, boards will go on retreats as a matter of uh, just, I think, to uh, increase the comfort level among members. Uh, so that they can uh, be more effective as a board. And there's absolutely no prohibition on that. They just need to be careful that they're not discussing uh, matters that would otherwise be discussed in a public setting 
uh, re related to that municipality's business. Um, so I think we've covered all the points there as far as what is not a meeting. So who is covered when it comes to the Sunshine Act? Well, it applies to any state or local government body. And when we talk about local government bodies, this would also include school boards. And because we mentioned school boards, it would also apply to charter schools. Um, and all committees. Now, this is an area uh, that there is not 100% agreement on as to at what level of committee um, would you open that up for application of the Sunshine Act. But given uh, what I will call a a lack of uh, true direction when it comes to court decisions at this point. I know uh, some who are familiar with the Sunshine Act might want to refer to Ristow versus Casey uh, to provide you know, a little more guidance. But looking at just the language that we have in the Act, it says uh, local state and local government bodies and all committees that perform an essential government function. And I think there is a key phrase that can provide a lot of guidance for us. Um, if, if you have a committee tasked with, for instance, reviewing all the ordinances to make sure that they are up to date uh, and potentially recommending this, uh, uh, the ab abolition of some ordinances or changes in language and so forth, I would be inclined to define that as an essential government function. If you have appointed an ad hoc committee that will oversee the uh, uh, celebration activities related to the girls' softball team winning the state championship, uh, there may be some people who take exception to my opinion here, but I would not necessarily define that as an essential government function. And this is coming from someone who uh, uh, lives down in Newberry Township where we have some state champions uh, when it comes to baseball and other sports. Uh, hopefully I won't get too much heat over that comment. But uh, uh, the other factor then is exercising authority to take official action. So we're, we relate this term back to committees. Is our committee tasked with exercising authority to take official action? Well, that begs the question, what is official action? And we look at the definition within the Sunshine Act and part of that definition is making recommendations. So what we're up against here is if we have a committee tasked with uh, performing an essential government function, which includes making recommendations to the main board, then we have the assumption that that committee should be subject to sunshine. Now, some of this is subjective. I readily admit that. And if we take a, a look at Ristow, which I think is probably the, the best case out there uh, providing guidance, uh, you may, you know, it may cloud the issue even more. My recommendation would be that if you are in doubt, lean towards transparency. Uh, because I think if you get in the habit of opening your committee meetings, uh, you're going to get a much warmer public reception than if your immediate reaction is to close the public meeting and worry about the fallout later because when that fallout hits, it could be significant. So as with most of the issues that the Office of Open Records deal with, our recommendation is that when in doubt, lean towards transparency and open up your processes. Okay, one of the requirements of the Sunshine Act is public notice, in that any public meeting needs to be pre-advertised so that the public is aware that said meeting is taking place so that they have the opportunity to participate. Typically, uh, for a regular public meeting, there needs to be at least three days advance notice of a regular meeting. Usually, the way this works is at the beginning of either the calendar or the fiscal year that that municipality follows, um, they will have an advertisement, a legal notice, and it will uh, uh, advertise the fact that there is an organizing meeting taking place, meaning a new board is preparing to organize and sit down. Uh, along with that, 
typically there would be a schedule of all the remaining meetings for that calendar or fiscal year. Uh, occasionally, a board will change that schedule uh, at the organization meeting. If that's the case, then they would need to reorganize or, or re-advertise those new dates. But usually, at the beginning of the year, there would be a legal notice saying we're having an organizing meeting within or, uh, three days from now or, or a longer period. And then also our plans are to have subsequent regular meetings on, let's say, the second Tuesday of every month. And it would list the dates for the next 12 months. Uh, that legal notice needs to be placed in a paid newspaper of general circulation. Uh, simply having a newspaper article, uh, I think what the industry calls a puff piece, where it's mentioned that the meetings are on the second Tuesday of every month would not be sufficient. It would have to be a legal notice. Advertising in a website uh, does not count. It has to be a paid newspaper of general circulation. And we realize that uh, due to changes in the newspaper industry and in, in the news media industry, uh, this is becoming a, a challenge for municipalities to, to meet this requirement. Uh, until we see a change in the law, however, this language stands. And those free sales circulars that many communities have, uh, that does not count. It needs to be a paid newspaper of general circulation. In addition, there needs to be a posting physically at the meeting site of the meeting schedule so that a member of the public coming into your borough hall or township building or school district administrative office can find that posting, the Sunshine Act posting, and they're able to see when the board meets for its regular business meetings that would be open to the public. Special meetings. Uh, there may be instances where an issue arises of such import that you cannot wait uh, the three days plus whatever lag time there is with uh, uh, having a legal notice uh, advertised in your paper. Uh, in those instances, you're required to have 24 hours advance notice. So this would be a meeting for a topic that cannot wait until the next regular scheduled business meeting. Uh, 24 hours advance notice, all the other conditions would apply as well. Occasionally, there may be a need for an emergency meeting. Uh, for instance, my favorite example is the snowplow. Uh, a, a small borough has one snowplow, and it breaks down, and uh, it's not worth it to affect repairs on it, or they're unable to do so. It's time to buy a new plow. We just really have no other choice. However, in order to uh, make that purchase, we need to have an emergency meeting of the board. So in instances like this, you're able to bring the board together without any pre-advertisement, without any public notification, in order to take that emergency action to purchase the new, the new snowplow because the forecast is predicting you know, two feet within uh, the next couple days. So you got to do it now. Uh, I would caution board members, though, this is not intended for you to create your own emergency so that you can subvert the uh, intent of the Sunshine Act in order to affect some sort of business outside of the public eye. Um, ultimately, you know, the word will get out, someone will file a complaint, and you could be facing significant sanctions. Um, and there is no notification requirement in the Sunshine Act if you choose to cancel a meeting. Um, you may have a regular scheduled board meeting for that month, but there's really no business at hand to take care of, so you decide to cancel. Or maybe uh, you can't get a quorum due to illnesses or vacations or whatever, so you choose to cancel that meeting that month. Uh, there's no requirement that you need to advertise that cancellation, although I would encourage you to do so whenever possible. This would be a good example of a time to use your websites uh, to use social media to get the word out there that this month's meeting is canceled. Uh, again, when I say we receive those phone calls, uh, occasionally it is from a, uh, 
a citizen who was upset because they uh, took time out of their busy schedule to attend a, a council meeting, got there and found that the door was locked. And it was not until the next day when they called the borough hall and spoke to a, an employee that they discovered, oh, well, we canceled the meeting. Uh, and that was decided a couple weeks ago. So again, uh, while it's not a requirement, nevertheless, I would encourage board members to uh, follow through and advertise cancellations whenever uh, reasonably possible. Okay, uh, that's the slide that's I just had. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Public comment. Uh, one of the tenets of the Sunshine Act is to allow the public to comment on business before a board. Now, that's not open-ended, however. Comment can be limited to residents and taxpayers within the jurisdiction of the board that is meeting. Um, for instance, occasionally you will run across uh, public interest groups who uh, want to comment publicly at a, a borough meeting. Uh, well, if no representatives or if the speaker of that public interest group is neither a resident or, nor taxpayer, the board can prevent them from commenting. Also, uh, we will occasionally get questions from a resident of an adjoining uh, municipality, can I go into this other municipality's public meeting and express my concerns over, you know, some issue that is having an impact on my property or whatever. Um, the board can uh, decide not to allow them to comment if they so choose. Um, the public has a right to comment on issues that are or may be before the board and these comments should take place before the board actually votes on that matter of business. So they need to uh, schedule the comment period during the public meeting accordingly. And if, uh, let's say they have an agenda and they stray from that agenda and an issue comes up and they decide to vote on that new issue, they need to pause and allow the public the opportunity to comment on that new issue before they take the actual vote. So the board may establish reasonable rules for public comment, and the most common one would be to establish time limits. Um, you know, we will only allow three minutes per commenter um, uh, during the public comment period. Uh, the idea of appointing a spokesperson for an interest group. Let's say that some issue has come up that has uh, uh, gained a lot of public attention and there are a lot of residents who suddenly show up at one of the regular meetings and they're all wearing the same t-shirts. Well, you can pretty well assume that they're concerned about the same issue and that their concerns are very similar. There is nothing preventing the, the president or whomever of the of council approaching that group and asking them to appoint a spokesperson and having that spokesperson ensure that all of the issues that that group in mass wants to raise are covered by the spokesperson. And it may be appropriate at that point to allow that spokesperson a little extra time to ensure that they do get a fair say and that all points raised or that all points of concern are raised during the comments. Uh, this is one of those instances where we hope that reasonable heads and reasonable thought will prevail, um, and which is, I think is why the law uses that term, reasonable. And also there is the practice among many boards that I've seen where they actually have uh, multiple comment periods and there's no requirement defined within the Sunshine Act as to how this should take place. But what I've seen, uh, a practice that seems to work fairly well, is that prior to any voting actions taken by the board, they will allow a comment period specific to those actions so that anyone standing up and commenting are commenting about what the board is getting ready to vote on and just that. 
And then to ensure that uh, the term or that phrase may be before the board is covered, there is a second comment period, usually occurring as the last item on the agenda for the night, uh, where anyone can stand up or any resident or taxpayer can stand up and basically just comment on issues that are of concern to them and that may occur or, or may present themselves before the board. Um, that seems to work out fairly well because then the meeting, the business side of the meeting moves along fairly well uh, at, a, 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 at a distinct pace. And then when you get into the general public comments, uh, a little more time can be taken for people to reflect on those issues that the board may not be uh, uh, contemplating at hand at that particular moment. That seems to work out well for them. But I do want to emphasize that it's not a requirement as dictated by any language in the Sunshine Act or case law since then. Executive sessions. Um, the Sunshine Act affords boards the opportunity to meet in private to deliberate on issues of a sensitive nature. And these executive sessions can be held before, during, or after an open meeting. Or if there isn't time with that particular evening to, to have uh, a sufficient executive session, they can announce the executive session for some future time. When making that announcement, the boards must give as complete a reason as possible for why they are meeting in executive session to ensure that the public is satisfied that reason is valid for an executive session. Now, that's a little bit of wordsmithing there, but if you take a look at the decision that is controlling on this, and it would be the city of Reading versus the Reading Eagle, which is the local newspaper for the city of Reading, uh, essentially the court said that the announcement has to be sufficiently specific so that the public is satisfied the board is meeting for a legitimate reason. So for a council president to stand up and say, we are going into executive session to discuss legal matters would not be sufficient. Rather, you know, if there is an active court case, they would need to reference that case. If they are going into executive session, let's say for a personnel issue, standing up and saying is for a personnel issue is not sufficient. Rather, they would need to get as, as specific as possible, realizing, and I'm the first to realize this, that uh, you need to be concerned about potential confidentiality violations. Uh, for instance, you could be going into executive session to discuss a disciplinary issue related to a specific staff member. And that specific staff member is covered by a union contract that may have a non-embarrassment clause. Well, to stand up and say that we are going into executive session to discuss whether or not we should suspend John Doe for two weeks would be violating the contractual language related to that non-embarrassment clause. So it becomes a balancing act. And what's the appropriate thing to say? How much information should I give out? So I think if it can be shown that the board and the spokesperson for the board is making a good faith effort to balance those various conditions, you're not gonna, you're not gonna run into any difficulty there. Uh, but I think, again, leaning towards transparency will get you through in these uh, instances. There is no requirement for taking minutes during an executive session. And just as an aside, if the board does choose to take minutes of the executive session, uh, they are exempt under the right to know law. So one, could not be, one would not be successful if they filed a right to know request for minutes of an executive session. Um, no exec, or I'm sorry, no official action can be taken during an executive session. A board can kind of resolve what it is they're going to do as a result of the deliberation that has taken place during an executive session. But that resolution must be memorialized with a vote that then takes place when the board reconvenes in public session. So 
the board goes into executive session. They deliberate about the issue at hand. Uh, they come to a resolution, well, this is what we need to do. They come out of the exec executive session, and if that matter is of such import that it needs to be memorialized with a vote, they then take the vote to uh, make it official as to what they resolve during the executive session. A board can meet for executive session based on seven reasons as defined in the Sunshine Act. Personnel matters, discussing labor negotiations, considering purchasing, leasing, or selling a property. Now, if you look at the act, uh, it does not say the sale of property. However, there is a decision out of the Commonwealth Court, an unpublished decision, where uh, they resolve that the sale of property falls under uh, this reasoning. Uh, consulting with counsel about litigation, avoid, avoiding the violation of privilege or confidentiality, obviously that would be uh, concerned mainly with discussions with uh, your solicitor. Discussing university admission standards, which obviously would have a limited application. And then a one that was just recently ha added where they can go into executive uh, session to discuss emergency preparedness issues. Violations. Um, at any time during a public meeting, a member of the public can bring it to the board's attention when they feel a violation is occurring. Essentially, they are putting the board on notice that, um, are you sure you want to do this? Or are you sure you're doing this in the appropriate manner? Because I think this is a violation of the Sunshine Act. OK, they have met whatever obligations, whatever rights they have by bringing it to the board's attention that they believe a violation is taking place. An agency can cure violations, uh, more or less like a no harm, no foul uh, scenario. Uh, let's go back, for instance, to the executive session example. Let's say that a board has met an executive session and resolved to take action, to take official action. However, when they reconvene in public session, something happens and they get distracted and they unwittingly move on to other business at hand without actually taking that vote that they resolved to do. And later that evening, after the meeting has adjourned, the president is sitting at home, and he suddenly realizes, we forgot to vote. We forgot to vote on that issue. Well, they can call a special meeting, or if the matter can wait until the next business meeting. The, board, the president of the board can then stand up at that point and, and explain the situation, saying, you know, we resolved to take this action, but we never actually took official action in the form of a vote. So we're going to take that vote now in order to cure the violation where we failed to vote before. By doing so, by affecting that cure, they then avoid uh, any legal liability as it relates to administration of the Sunshine Act. However, if the public, if a member of the public does have a complaint about uh, the actions of the board and believes that, in fact, a violation of the Sunshine Act occurs, there is no central office or central agency. For instance, the Office of Open Records, as I said earlier, does not have any enforcement authority. The public would not come to us in order to file a complaint. Rather, the Sunshine Act allows and empowers that member of the public to go directly to the appropriate court and seek legal relief. And if they believe that in addition to this actual Sunshine Act violation, that there is some sort of criminal intent, in addition to going to, let's say, the county court, they can also go, excuse me, go to their county district attorney and file a complaint related to the criminal aspects of the perceived violation. All of this has to occur within 30 days of the alleged violation, of you know, the meeting where the alleged violation occurred. Um, depending on what the judge decides, uh, meetings can be voided, and all actions that took place at that meeting can be voided. Uh, the judge may simply issue notice to the board saying, yeah, you violated it, don't do it again. 
or if the judge thinks that the violation is particularly egregious, they can levy fines. It's up to $1,000 per board member for the first violation, and it's up to $2,000 per board member for the second violation. Those fines are not levied on the agency or the municipality. Rather, they're levied on the individual board members, and the municipality cannot pay the fine on behalf of the board members. It comes out of their personal account, their personal pockets. So that's how that works. And then just some miscellaneous points that I want to bring to your attention is that um, the Sunshine Act says that boards must produce meeting minutes uh, that essentially record attendance of members of the board. It needs to memorialize what came up for business and how each board member voted per a roll call vote, yay or nay. There is no requirement that boards have an agenda beforehand. Uh, and if they have an agenda, there is no requirement that boards necessarily follow it. Now, that raises a lot of eyebrows, uh, particularly among members of the public, uh, particularly when uh, they say, I went to this board meeting and they voted on an issue that wasn't on the agenda, so I wasn't prepared to address it or they never produce an agenda, so I have no idea what they're doing. Uh, so how am I supposed to know what it is I'm allowed to comment on, that sort of thing. Um, so while there is no requirement for an agenda, we encourage board mem uh, boards to have them uh, and follow them whenever possible, and also whenever possible, have those agendas available uh, ahead of time so that the public can be prepared to participate in the uh, business of the meeting. The public can record public meetings and they can do it unannounced. And that includes um, audio as well as video recordings. So I, as a member of the public, now think about this, I can walk into a public meeting and I can turn my cell phone on record, keep it in my pocket, and I don't have to tell anyone that I'm doing it. It would not be a violation of the Sunshine Act, nor is it a violation of Pennsylvania wiretap law. I think it is a good practice at the beginning of the meeting for the president or the presiding officer to stand and notify everyone that this meeting may be recorded by any member of the public. The board, the solicitor, and other members of the public um, technically cannot object to anyone recording those meetings. Now, if the agency itself is in the practice of recording their meetings, whether it be for purposes of uh, keeping minutes, for um, streaming the, the meeting on a website, or just for having it as um, you know, a matter of a public record, uh, that's what it is, it, a recording that is in the possession of the municipality, whether it be individual board members who have recorded it themselves or the office of the municipality. Um, that recording is a public record as soon as that public meeting has concluded and is accessible through the right to know law until such time that that file is erased or disposed of in any way. The other point that I want to clarify, that I want to emphasize, is that if you have an individual board member who is just taking it upon themselves to record the meeting, uh, even though they say they're acting as a private citizen, it doesn't matter. They are an officer of that municipality and as such, that recording is a public record, and that if a right to know request were provided to the municipality for a recording of that meeting, that public official would be obligated to provide that copy as a public record. Okay, I want to thank you all for your time, and again, if you've had questions relating to this, please write them down. 
uh, or if you're uh, with us by webinar, make sure that they get in and uh, we'll do our best to make sure that they're answered either at the closing of the session or I'll be sure to get back to you within the next few days. I'm going to turn uh, the remote over to our chief counsel, uh, Charles <laughs> Reese Brown now. Thank you, John. Uh, excuse me, hopefully I will uh, be able to use this a little second. Uh, thank you, George, for a great presentation. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Charles Reese Brown. Is uh, anybody having a problem with my mic? Okay. We have a problem with your signal. Okay. If anybody has a card completed in the room, you can hold it up, and Dylan will come around and get it if you have a completed question card. Might as well take the opportunity. Oops. How are we now, Nathan? Okay, uh, again, my name is Charles Reese Brown. I'm the Chief Counsel for the Office of Open Records. And my portion of the uh, program, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the case law that we've seen uh, since our last training. Uh, a couple of cases came out of the Commonwealth Court, which I think are significant, and a couple which have come out of the Courts of Common Pleas. And I'd also like to uh, draw your attention to some uh, pending upcoming cases that we're going to see uh, next year. We've got several coming out of the uh, Supreme Court, a couple coming out of the Commonwealth Court, and uh, some interesting ones coming out of the uh, Courts of Common Pleas. So we'll uh, you know, we'll talk about those cases. And I think I'm pointing it. Yeah, yeah there you go. Good. Oh, oh no, down. 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 There we one go. One more. And it, there's a delay, so there you go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, we're first going to talk about agencies. Uh, we have received appeals from requests to uh, individuals, uh, law firms, uh, hospitals, libraries, uh, bill collectors. Uh, we've even seen uh, re requests going to Congress people. Uh, the right to know law doesn't apply to them. The right to know law applies to agencies. And if you look at section 102 of the law, that defines what an agency is. And they're categorized as judicial agencies, what you think of uh, the courts, uh, clerks of courts, uh, domestic relations offices, uh, probation offices, uh, prothonotary, and they're, they're only required to disclose financial records. Uh, you also have legislative agencies, uh, the House and the Senate, and there are various uh, agencies that serve them. They're required to provide uh, legislative records only. Uh, you have commonwealth agencies, uh, the governor, the treasurer, uh, the auditor general, the attorney general, um, and those departments under their command, uh, you have independent agencies, uh, utility commission, the liquor control board, uh, state affiliated agencies, uh, PIAA, they're all considered commonwealth agencies. Uh, you also have local agencies. Uh, you have your counties, uh, your cities, uh, your municipalities, uh, boroughs, townships, school districts, uh, municip municipal authorities. But you also have uh, what's called a similar governmental entity. And that's, uh, that can be considered a local agency and thus subject to the, uh, to the right to know law. And so we have these uh, two cases in front of you, the, the, the Peicher and uh, the WNEP, also uh, referred to as Bowman. And there, uh, the OOR, uh, the local, uh, I believe it was Carbon County, um, and uh, the Commonwealth Court considered whether volunteer fire companies are similar governmental agencies or similar governmental entities and thus local agencies under the right to know law. You had a couple of requests for some financial records to uh, the Clinton Township Fire Department. Uh, following a long-standing precedent before the OOR, we concluded that, concluded that firefighting was a governmental function and that because there was some case law uh, finding that fire companies had the governmental immunity under the Judicial Code and the Political Subdivision Tort Claims Act, we concluded that they were local agencies uh, under the right to know law. Now in these two cases, the uh, fire company appealed to the local court. Uh, the local court upheld us. Some county courts have uh, upheld us and other county courts have not. So they, at the county level, it's kind of uh, gone both ways. 
Uh, but here, Clinton Township, uh, their fire company, appealed up to the Commonwealth Court, and we thought, hey, great, you know, the Commonwealth Court's going to weigh in, and we're going to get a get a statewide ruling as to what you know what is a fire company. And uh, the court looked at the case, and they said that uh, governmental immunity didn't determine the status of an entity uh, as to whether or not it's a local agency under the right to know law. They looked at or they said you need to look at the degree of government control. Um, how is the entity created? Um, who controls it? Who are the employees? Uh, how is it operated? Uh, but they also said that there was no evidence of record for, to allow them to make a determination as to whether or not there was sufficient governmental control over this fire company to, uh, to make a determination as to its uh, status under the right to know law. So they, they've remanded it to us uh, the WNEP case uh, got withdrawn. Uh, they're not interested in board. Uh, pie shirt is still pending, and uh, we're waiting for the uh, fire company to, uh, you know, to, to make their evidentiary submission. So we'll see where, where that goes. But the important point about the, this case is that it's a reminder that the Commonwealth Court does not want to get into fact-finding, even though there is a right of de novo review and the right to uh, take uh, new evidence. You know, the Commonwealth Court is pretty much making it very clear that they don't want to do that. But you don't see that sort of translating to the uh, common pleas level, but uh, you never know what's going to happen. And uh, also, it's important to point out that if you are a nonprofit corporation, uh, there may be situations where there is a sufficient degree of government control over your entity to bring it to within the orbit of the right to know law. So I, I would look at uh, you know look at the Peicher case, uh, watch you know watch our uh, uh, website for uh, when we issue a final determination. Um, I don't know where it's going to go depending on you know um, how we rule, but uh, just keep that in mind. So it's down. Huh? Yes. There we go. Uh, the next case I'd like to talk about are uh, records or uh, equity forward, and this involves uh, contractor records. Now, records, I guess mine, I'm really having a problem. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you got two dead mics on the floor. Right. Dead voice. Thank you. <clears throat> now, where the, <clears throat> excuse me, the frog says hello. <clears throat> now, uh, where there are records that are requested and they are not in the possession of the government, but they are in the possession of a government contractor, they may be subject to disclosure under the right to know law, and you need to look at section 506D1 of the law. And for 506D1 to apply, there needs to be a contract, the contract needs to be for the performance of a governmental function, and the records that you're requesting need to be directly related to the performance of that governmental function. Now, in Equity Forward, there was a request for uh, the records of a uh, pregnancy services uh, provider for the Department, uh, Department of Human Services. Uh, DHS uh, denied it. They said, we don't have any records. Uh, they went to their contractor, uh, I believe it was Real Alternatives, and uh, the contractor said, uh, we have records, but they're not related to our contract with, uh, with DHS, and therefore, and they're not subject to disclosure under the right to know law. Went before the Office of Open Records. Uh, we received evidence, uh, 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 testimony from uh, the contractor saying that these records have nothing to do with you know, what, uh, what we do for, for, the, for the department. And we credited it and found that the records weren't directly related. Uh, there was an appeal to Commonwealth Court, and Commonwealth Court looked at the evidence, and they felt it wasn't sufficient. You know, they felt that it was uh, sort of conclusory. And what they couldn't understand is what were the services being provided by a, these third-party contractors, and what were the services being provided by the contractor, you know, with the government. And since they couldn't tell, you know, what they what the difference was, they weren't able to make a determination as to whether or not the requested records were uh, directly related, you know, to the contract. Uh, and again, they've remanded it back to us to take additional evidence, and uh, that case is. Uh, is pending, and I think the takeaway, other than Commonwealth Court not wanting to act as a fact finder, is that uh, if you are the government or a contractor and you are saying that the requested records don't fall within 506 D1, the burden is on you to prove it. 
the burden isn't on the requester to prove that those records are directly related to the government uh, function. The burden's on the government to, to show that uh, the records are directly related. Okay, coroner's records. Um, this next case sort of draws attention to a very significant uh, public health crisis that we're, uh, we're facing here in Pennsylvania as, as well as across the nation, and that's uh, the opioid crisis. Uh, since you know, the opioid crisis has sort of exploded, we have seen a large um, increase in requests for information from co coroner's offices uh, for records related to uh, opioid deaths. And uh, for coroner's records, the Supreme Court has said there's two ways you can get at them. Uh, you can go to the coroner and ask for them directly through the right to know law, or you can wait until they're deposited with the prothonotary and you can get them through the Coroner's Act. And what the Coroner's Act does, it requires within 30 days after the end of every calendar year for the coroner to deposit all of his official papers with the prothonotary, and the Coroner's Act makes all those records expressly public. But in the cases that you know, we've seen you know, with coroners, there's not a lot of consistency in terms of how the coroners deal with uh, their obligations under the Coroner's Act. Some coroners give everything to the prothonotary, they just dump it off with them. Some sort of pick and choose and say, we're gonna give you these records, we're not gonna give you these records. Uh, some coroners and prothonotaries work out an agreement whereby the coroner keeps all the records and the prothonotary says, we don't want them, you know, you keep them. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that you know, we can't order the deposit of uh, coroner records with the prothonotary so that they're public. You have to go. Uh, you have to go to court, and so that brings us to the uh, you know, to the Walker case. And there, uh, I believe this was a news media, and uh, they requested uh, autopsy records and toxicology reports uh, from the coroner, and the coroner denied it and said, uh, you know, we don't. We give those records to the prothonotary. Um, you know, I think you know, they destroyed them. Uh, we, you know, we ordered disclosure. Uh, the coroner appealed to the uh, to the county court. During the course of the appeal at the county court, uh, eventually the, the the media filed a a mandamus action, uh, require seeking to require the coroner to deposit all of their records uh, with the prothonotary. Uh, the coroner's office uh, was very uh, pushed back very hard on this. They, you know, understandably so. They they felt that, uh, you know, the relatives of the decedents, you know, certainly didn't want to be uh, uh, feel further pain with, you know, for their their relatives, you know, records being released. Um, but the court, you know, looked at the right of privacy under the Constitution, and they found that it was a a personal right, and the right, you know, rested with the, the decedent, and unfortunately. Uh, stayed with the decedent, so the, the right to privacy didn't attach to uh, to, to the relatives, and the uh, the court also found uh, that uh, the coroner had no discretion to decide you know what records were official papers and what weren't. You know the court found that you know, if the coroner is you know producing these records in the course of his official duties, they're his official papers, and they're required to be deposited with the prothonotary. Uh, I don't know if that case has been uh, appealed to the Commonwealth Court, um, but it, it's a very interesting case. Again, you've got you know, the, the docket citation there. It's, uh, it's a very, uh, very interesting opinion, very well-written opinion by the judge. Um, so I, I highly uh, recommend it. If, you, if you're interested in it and you want a copy, you contact us and we'll ha be happy to give, you know, to give you a copy. Okay, this next case, uh, the Bradshaw case, involves uh, donation records. Uh, records of donations from individuals to the government are exempt from disclosure under Section 708B13. And uh, here we had a case where a corporation made a donation to uh, California University, actually their foundation, and uh, somebody wanted to see records related to that, and the, the university said, no, these are exempt under the right to know law. You know, it came to us, uh, we said that the statute says individual 
the Statutory Construction Act has a different uh, definition for individuals versus persons. You know, persons include uh, include corporations, individuals don't. So we you know, we held that uh, the exemption didn't apply to a corporate donation. Uh, they appeal to uh, you know to court, um, arguing that the term individuals should apply to corporations because the definition of an individual in the associations code, which the uh, foundation uh, dealt with as well as the uh, tax reform code, looped in corporate entities into the uh, definition of an individual. You know, the court looked at this and they uh, they looked at our determination and they concluded that uh, even though the right to know law doesn't define individuals, looking at the Statutory Construction Act, which is really the, you know, the key law for interpreting statutes, is uh, they define uh, individuals as natural persons and persons uh, include corporate entities. And since the General Assembly in the exemption and the right to know law said individuals and not persons, persons, the exemption applies only to, uh, to individuals. So if you're a corporation to make a donation, your records are going to be subject to disclosure. Uh, if you're an individual, uh, you fall within the exemption. Education records. Uh, the Westchester case uh, gives us some uh, analysis on what constitutes an education record. Now, education records are protected from disclosure by a federal law, the uh, Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act. It's also uh, colloquially known as, uh, as FERPA. And in the Rodriguez case, which we have uh, showing for you, there was a request for records which included emails, and they unquestionably involved students. And the university said these are related to students. Uh, they're exempt under FERPA. Uh, when it came to us, we said uh, no. They're not subject to. Uh, they're not subject to FERPA. You know, we felt that they were not education records. Uh, one, because they didn't deal with academics or discipline of a student, and number two, they weren't maintained in the student's files. And you know, our analysis was that those those were the uh, the elements you needed to meet to fall within the definition of an education record, and avail yourself of the protections of, uh, of FERPA. When the case got to the Commonwealth Court, the Commonwealth Court said uh, your analysis is a little overly restrictive, and they pointed to two cases which had been decided after we had issued our decision in Rodriguez, and which actually are currently on appeal to the Supreme Court, which we'll talk briefly about later. Uh, but they said that you know the focus isn't on you know the status of the uh, you know of the record, whether it relates to an academic re matter or a disciplinary matter, you know, the, the focus is on whether it's directly related to a student as opposed to tangentially related to the student. With respect to the, uh, to where it's maintained, they, you know, they recognize that emails are probably not gonna make it into a student's file. And so they said, it doesn't necessarily need to be in a student's file, but it just needs to be maintained in some manner which preserves the record and allows for the ability to track requests for the record. So they've uh, they've remanded that case to us to uh, to reanalyze based on on the uh, on the, the these prior two cases. The one is uh, uh, Eastern Area School District versus Miller, and the other involves uh, Fox 43. But you know we'll have sites for them later. Um, so we'll we'll see where where that goes. These next two cases, they're uh, they're pretty much the same case. They're they're related. One's reported, one's unreported, but they uh, address the issue of to what extent records which are shared with a third party can still meet the exemption for internal pre-decisional deliberations, and that exemption is is found at uh, 708 B10 little i big A, and it exempts records uh, which are internal to the agency, uh, which involve uh, matters before a decision is made and which involve matters which are deliberative. In other words, they're not purely factual. Um, so uh, in, in Infinity, uh, a request was made for records regarding uh, the City of Chester's Act 47 recovery plan, specifically uh, the proposed sale of the Chester Water Authority. And as part of the Act 47 um, you know, 
process. And for those of you who don't know what Act 47 is, it's uh, distressed municipalities, basically. Uh, it's sort of a state-level bankruptcy type, type law. Uh, and it's administ administered by the Department of Community and Economic Development. And in the, in, in the case, uh, DCED hired a you know, consultant to be on their Act 47 team. And that consultant then hired subcontractors to provide other services you know, on that uh, you, on that project, and you know, they were all working together to to help uh, you know sell the uh, Chester Water Authority. And then there was a request for records related you know to the sale of the Water Authority. And DCD you know said uh, these are you know, internal pre-decisional deliberations. They're denied. Um, the requester came to us and said, "Wait a minute. These were you know these were shared with the contractor, but it was also shared with a subcontractor, which had no relationship whatsoever with the Commonwealth, and therefore they're not internal to the Commonwealth, and therefore they're not subject to the exemption." Um, we looked at it, we a analyzed it, and we we felt that uh, they met the uh, you know the terms of the exemption. That went up to Commonwealth Court, and the court recognized that this was really you know the first time that. The exemption was being extended beyond, you know, the uh, you know the contractor with you know with, with the government, and, and the court looked at the fact that the you know the prime contractor in their proposal to, to DCD said we're going to be hiring these subcontractors, and you know the prime contractor said we're going to be paying them half of our fee, and uh, the uh, you know the court looked at Act 47 and they found that those services were specifically you know contemplated by Act 47 and noted that, you know, the evidence was that these subcontractors were intimately involved. They were part and parcel of the of the Act 47 team. And so they, you know, found that, you know, the communications were still internal to DCED, even though they were being shared with someone that DCED didn't have a direct contractual relationship with. And from what I can tell, I think this is the first time that that exemption's ever been extended, you know, that far. Um, I think it's really on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. I think that they were very, you know, fact-driven, very you know, fact-specific on this. I, you know, I'm, yeah, there, I'm sure there's probably going to be another factual scenario where it may be extended. I can't think of what it is, but you know, this, I thought this was a pretty, uh, pretty significant case. Okay, judicial records. Um, this next case, the the Williams case, uh, you know, talks about judicial records, and it sort of uh, seems to indicate that courts are sort of expanding what they consider judicial records, and therefore not uh, subject to disclosure under under the right to know law. You know, you can look at Section 102 that uh, you know talks what, what are judicial agencies. Uh, Section 304. Uh, you know, shows the obligations of judicial agencies are, are really only to disclose financial records. Uh, pretty much other, any other record of a judicial agency is not disclosable under the uh, under the right to know law. Um, when you get into uh, case files, uh, you know there you're getting into common law rights of access, but it, it's not under the right to know law. Uh, judicial agencies also have their own appeals officers, uh, but one of the things it, I think is really interesting is the right to know law doesn't define a judicial record. But the Commonwealth Court in the Stover case, which I think was last year or maybe the year before we talked about, you know, has said that a record, even though it's in the possession of an agency that OOR has jurisdiction over, um, if it's created by the judiciary, that's a judicial record and it's not subject to disclosure under the right to know law. Now, Stover expressly limited its, its holding to, to judicial orders. And in the Williams case, where we have here, there was a request for a uh, jury pool list, a veneer list. Um, I guess it was uh, Mr. Williams, the uh, list of jurors who were going to serve on his criminal trial. And the DA denied the request, saying that uh, these are judicial records. When it came to us, uh, you know, we looked at it and said, you know, these aren't the type of records which are contemplated by Stover. You know, it's not a, uh, it's not a judicial order. It doesn't reveal the workings of the judiciary. Um, this, this, you know, it's not like it, it's a judge's telephone records. It's, you know, not those types of things. And so we ordered disclosure. It went up to the Philadelphia court. Uh, they said we didn't have jurisdiction. It then went up to the Commonwealth court. And it, well, the Philadelphia court, you know, said these were judicial records, and then it went up to the Commonwealth Court, and the Commonwealth Court, uh, they remanded it back to the Philadelphia court for sort of an unrelated issue, more of a procedural issue. But what is interesting is they didn't 
you know, they didn't find any fault with the, the, with the Philly court sort of expanding what is a judicial record to something beyond, uh, you know, beyond a court order. So, you know, my takeaway from this case is I think if it goes up to the, you know, if a case like this goes up to the Commonwealth, I think the Commonwealth court is uh, most likely going to expand the definition of uh, what type of record um, is a judicial record, which you can't get under the, uh, under the right to know law, even though the record may be possessed by a, uh, by a Commonwealth or a local agency, and even though it may document a transaction or activity of that agency. So I, I, I think that's, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, fees and penalties. Uh, everybody's favorite topic, depending on which end of the point of stick you're on. Uh, Section 1304 of uh, the right to know law allows a court to impose court costs and attorney's fees where an agency acts in bad faith in denying access or furthers an unreasonable interpretation of, of the law. Uh, 1304 also allows a court to sanction a requester for filing frivolous, frivolous appeals. Uh, Section 1305 allows a court to impose civil penalties, and they can impose a civil penalty of up to $1,500 a day where an agency denies access in bad faith, and they can also impose a civil penalty of $500 per day where an agency or a public official fails to comply with a court order, ordering disclosure. Now, these, these next two cases, the Scranton case, there was a request for uh, a video of the FBI marching into City Hall and seizing a bunch of records. Uh, the city denied the request, you know, saying it was like, well, there's a criminal investigation, B-16. And we said, well, you're not doing the investigation, so that's not going to fly. And we ordered disclosure. And eventually, you know, the city didn't cough it up. And eventually, uh, the, the, the newspaper filed a, an enforcement action. And during the course of the enforcement action, it turns out that, you know, the video was... Um, wasn't properly preserved. I think there was a copy of it, but um, I think over the, through the course of time, it, it, it pretty much degraded and degraded, and it was pretty much useless. And you know what the court found is that the court found that you know they weren't going to say the city was willful and and you know you know damaging the video, but they they, they found negligence. And in a uh, sanctions hearing, they said you know bad faith doesn't you know require you to act fraudulently or corruptly, you know, if you fail to follow the law or if you fail to carry out your duties, you know, that's sufficient to find bad faith. And so they found, uh, you know, they, they assessed uh, $3,500 uh, in, uh, in penalties for the city's failure to preserve that video. And what I think is really, really interesting about this case is this is the first case I'm aware of where a court has come out and said, you know, where there's a request for records, you've got a duty to preserve it. Now, in the civil litigation context, I mean, that's that's a no-brainer. If somebody asks, you know, if somebody says, I'm going to sue you, you know, you've got a duty to preserve every single record related, you know, potentially related to that lawsuit. Um, it's not expressly in the right to know law. It, it's certainly, I think, you know, intended by the General Assembly. But this is the first case where a court has actually, you know, come out and, you know, stated very strongly where you have notice of a request for a record, you've got a duty to properly preserve that record. So, the, you know, I... I uh, this is uh, this this was a case which really uh, really <clears throat> excuse me caught our eye. Uh, the Warren Ethics Commission case. Uh, this involved a request for records where the agency said they don't exist, we don't have them, and the requester didn't appeal, and they go about their merry way. And in a in another unrelated proceeding, you know the Ethics Commission said, oh by the way, here are these records. And they were the records which were previously requested, and they had said don't exist. And the requester said, "Wait a minute, um, I want some money for you know, <clears throat> excuse me, my lawyers." And so he filed a uh, an action with the Commonwealth Court directly seeking attorney's fees. And the Commonwealth Court said, uh, "No, you can't do that." And again, 
the thing to keep in mind is there was no appeal to the Office of Open Records. And the court said their jurisdiction under the right to know law to impose fees and sanctions arises out of a final determination from an appeals officer. And so the process is you, you need to you know, make your request, get denied, you know, file an appeal with whatever appeals officer you're dealing with, and then, you know, and then if you want you know, sanctions, attorney's fees, costs, you know, then go to the court. So you, you, you can't bypass the, uh, the appeals officer stage. Right to privacy. Uh, these next two cases, the Campbell and the Bay case, um, they sort of uh, refine the court's consideration of the right to privacy uh, and personal information, which is held by the government. Uh, about three years ago, in the Pennsylvania State Education Association case, the Supreme Court held that individuals have a right to privacy in their personal information even if that information is held by the government, and that arises out of uh, the Constitutional's Article I, uh, Section 1. And what the PSEA court said is that you can't release personal information unless you perform a balancing test where you weigh the public's interest in disclosure against the individual's right to privacy. And only where the public's interest in disclosure outweighs the right to privacy can you disclose that information? Otherwise, it's, it's, it's public. Uh, the court later on in the Reese case you know, held that even if a statute expressly declares information public, if it's personal information, it's subject to the, uh, to the PSEA balancing test. And in Reese, there was, uh, there's uh, Commonwealth employee information, which the administrative code expressly made public. And uh, the court said, you know, we, we don't care if the administrative code says it's public, you've got to perform the balancing test. But that brings us to the Campbell and the, and the Bay cases. And in Campbell, I think the court dug a little deeper in, ter in terms of what factors go into determining what is personal information and that can't be disclosed without applying the balancing test. And in Campbell, there was a request for various uh, information of Commonwealth employees, including their county of residence. Uh, the governor's office denied it under the right to privacy. <clears throat> Excuse me, when it came to us, uh, we held that you know, an employee's county of residence doesn't in, you know, reveal anything personal about the employee, and so it's not personal information, which would be subject to the balancing test. When it went up to the Commonwealth Court, uh, they reversed it and held that your county of residence alone is personal information um, subject to the balancing test. But the factors that they looked at, I think, can give you some insight as to what is and isn't personal information. And, uh, you know, they looked at why does the government have this information? And they found that the only reason, you know, the government had this information was to help the employee out in carrying out, you know, the, the employees, not the government's, you know, duties, specifically, you know, taxing uh, issues, you know, where to send the, you know, their, their tax tax money. Um, they looked at, was there an expectation of privacy in this information? And they found that the only reason the government had this was because th this information was in an employee's personnel file. And they said employees have you know, a, a reasonable expectation of privacy in their own personnel file. And they also looked into, you know, does this information provide any insight into the operations of the government or you know, the individual employee's performance of their duties? And you know, the court said, you know, your county of residence you know, reveals nothing about you know, what the government does. And so they said, this is the type of information which is subject to the balancing test. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the requester in this case you know, knew about the balancing test, and he said, I specifically am not going to articulate any public interest in the balancing test because I don't have to. And the court made note of that and then decided to see if there was a public interest, concluding there was not. The court said, you're not going to get that information. Now, in the Bay case, this reiterates the concept that when you're applying the balancing test, that if there is a significant or if there's a, a significant public interest that would warrant disclosure, you need to consider whether there are other means of meeting that interest without violating the right to privacy. 
And in Bay, there was a request for records, um, all sorts of information related to liquor license applicants, including their residency information, because I, I think the liquor code has um, some residency requirements for uh, license applicants. And uh, the, the, co the, the board uh, denied under the right to privacy. Um, when it came to us, you know, we said that, uh, we, we concluded that ensuring compliance with the law, specifically the residency requirement, was a public interest which outweighed, you know, the, the individual's right to privacy. Now, when, the, uh, when that went up to court, the, courts, uh, the court said, yeah, that's a pretty significant public interest. You know, you want to make sure that, you know, liquor licenses are, are you know, issued according to law and that liquor licensees are operating according to law. But the court also found that there were other means available to, uh, to ensure compliance with the liquor code, specifically uh, the uh, challenge provisions of the liquor code. If you don't think a licensee is, has met the terms, there are specific uh, protest provisions. Uh, there are also provisions that uh, allow you to go to the state police. They've got a specific bureau dedicated to liquor law enforcement. And so what the court said is that you know, you know, this is a, a significant interest. And the court also presumed that the government always follows the law. Uh, but they said, you know, they said, even though there's a significant, you know, interest, there are other ways of meeting that interest without uh, violating the right to privacy. So when, uh, you know, when personal information is being requested, it, I, th I think it's incumbent on agencies, you know, the OOR as well as the uh, as well as the courts to, uh, you know, if they find a, a public interest, to see, you know, are there other means of meeting that public interest you know, that don't involve, you know, violating the right to privacy. I'm late for time. What's that? Okay. Okay, we've got a few cases. Uh, I just wanted to talk about, you know, I, I sort of consider them procedural you know, cases. The first is uh, Croco versus uh, the Department of Health. And this concerns waiver. And here we had, excuse me, a request for uh, records related to non hospital abortion providers. The Department of Health denied it, and we agreed that disclosure of this information would be reasonably likely to threaten personal security. Um, the uh, requester uh, requested reconsideration and raised an issue with us on reconsideration, and, and which we, we denied. And they also raised, this, raised the same issue with, with the court. They said, you know, there's this whole other law which makes this information public. And so that uh, you know, we, we think that uh, that, it, that it's especially public, notwithstanding the, the security exemption. And the court said, uh, "Too bad you waived it. Um, if uh, if you don't raise your arguments before the fact finder, uh, you've waived it." And uh, the court, you know, again, you know, the Commonwealth Court does not want to be a fact finder, and they, you know restated that absent unusual circumstances you know if you don't raise it in front of the uh, you know the OOR you know we're not going to consider it so if you have a legal argument that uh, that you need to raise make sure you raise it before uh, you know before us or the appropriate appeals officer the other interesting thing about Croco is they they had a real brief discussion about uh, judicial notice um, about web pages non-governmental web pages now, for those of you who don't know, judicial notice and its companion uh, doctrine, uh, administrative notice, which they're basically the same thing but different tribunals. One's a court and one's an administrative agency. Judicial and administrative notice is basically you don't need to have formal evidence presented where the fact is completely, you know, incapable of being impeached. Um, for example, if one of the elements of you know, your, your cause is the sun rises in the east, I don't think you don't need to have an astronomer say the sun rises in the east. That's something everybody knows. So that's the kind of fact which would be uh, judicially noticed. But here there was a request for judicial notice of, of a non-governmental web page, and they were trying to get it noticed in order to say that the security exemption shouldn't apply because you know these individuals, they've put their names out there you know, on the the web and we all know the web doesn't lie, um, but the court said while the web, uh, you know, while the web is a fantastic tool, you know, it's it, you know, you need to have some sort of evidence of the accuracy of non-governmental web pages. You know, it's uh, you know, you know governmental web pages. You know, they, you know, courts will generally uh, almost always you know take judicial notice of, but you know, non uh, non-governmental web pages uh, not so much. So I, I thought that was kind of an interesting. Uh, the McKelvey case, this is one of our uh, 
marijuana cases. And again, this uh, highlights the court's reluctance to act as a fact finder. And you know, the request was for medical marijuana license applications. Uh, Department of Health denied it based on the trade secret exemption. When it came to us, we realized that the Department of Health had never looked at the unredacted records you know, to determine whether or not you know, the trade exemption applied. You know, they had simply relied on the, on the license applicants you know, to, to, to say that the information was a trade secret. And we said, you know, hold on. Uh, we stayed the appeal, and we sent it back to the Department of Health, and we said, Health, look at the unredacted records and make your determination based on your actual review of the, of, of the records, and then we'll allow you time to make a submission and make a ruling. Uh, time went by. They made their submission. We made our, our, our ruling. We granted the uh, we granted access. Uh, the case went up to the Commonwealth Court, and the Commonwealth Court, uh, well, the, uh, the department and uh, the applicants, they wanted to submit uh, new evidence in front of the Commonwealth Court. And the Commonwealth Court, in very excruciatingly clear language, said that they were not going to take new evidence absent really unique circumstances. You know, they specifically said that the stay that we implemented uh, provided maximum due process to the litigants. It gave them ample opportunity to review the records, to submit evidence, to submit argument. Um, they did like the, you know, they felt that bypassing, you know, the OOR, you know, sort of undermines, you know, the goals of the right to know law and felt that if, if you don't submit evidence of the right to know law, that's not an excuse for, for being able to supplement the record. So uh, I think the takeaway from uh, the McKelvey case is, you know, again, you know, the obligation to present evidence before the fact finder, but also the court uh, seemed to, uh, you know, seemed to, uh, well, didn't object to our, you know, initiating the stay where, you know, we didn't, you know, go back and ask for, you know, for, for additional time to issue a final determination. We just said, you know, this matter is being stayed in order, you know, to develop the record. So that was a, that, that was a pretty important case. Uh, the Berks County case was a very strong case that's, that came out, and it discussed the power and the extent to which the Office of Open Records has the authority to conduct in-camera review of records. And for those of you who don't know what in-camera review is, that's where we actually take the records, either in their unredacted form or the records that were withheld, and we physically look at them. And to determine whether the exemption, you know, has been met. It's, it's an incredibly valuable fact-finding tool. You know, sometimes there's no other way of figuring out whether or not, you know, a record meets the exemption than to look at it. Classic example are internal pre-decisional deliberations. One of the uh, sort of exception to the exemption is purely factual material. So you might have a do document that says, we should propose this course of action, we can propose this course of action, but both of those scenarios are predicated on a factual predicate. You know, that factual predicate isn't subject to the exemption unless if you look at that factual predicate, it's gonna reveal the proposed, you know, the proposed option. So generally factual material isn't, you know, isn't, dis uh, isn't is disclosable. And in-camera review is a fantastic way of figuring out, you know, Factual material. Same for attorney-client privilege. You know, not not everything that's produced by a, by an attorney is, is going to be privileged. So it's it's a very important fact-finding tool. But here there was a request for records uh, for for uh, for an ICE facility, uh, and that is in capital I C E. And uh, when it came to us, uh, we ordered in-camera review, and the county objected. You know, the county said there was no request for in-camera review, and the case law says that you can only do in-camera review if a party asks you to do in-camera review. Um, we said, we understand your objection. We want to see the records, and they gave us the records, and we did our thing. We issued our final determination. Now, instead of appealing to the Court of Common Pleas, Berks County, uh, the county decided to sue us directly. And they sued us saying we had no authority to order in camera review unless a requester asks for it. And they also said that uh, noting that our executive director is not a lawyer, you know, also said that non-lawyers you know, cannot look at in camera records without violating uh, the Supreme Court's exclusive uh, control over the practice of law. And the court looked at this and very uh, tersely noted that neither of these uh, claims are legally valid. Now, with respect 
to our authority to perform in camera review, the court said, you know, these prior cases, they didn't directly consider, you know, the issue of whether, uh, of whether the OOR could, you know, uh, order in camera on its own. There actually was a case years ago called School Foro, which, you know, had been teed up to discuss that issue, but the court decided on other grounds. So, you know, this was the first time the court had actually directly confronted it. But in any event, the court said, you know, the other cases didn't de deal with deal with that, that issue. And they also noted that in-camera review is a procedural fact-finding tool, which is reserved to the discretion of an appeals officer. And to condition an appeals officer's, you know, fact-finding ability on the, the control of one of the parties uh, is going to kind of, it would be kind of absurd. So they, you know, the court said, you know, OOR, you've got the authority to, to order in camera review whether a party asks for it or not. So, you know, th this case pretty much resolves that, although, you know, I'll be talking a little bit about another case which is, is pending in front of the Supreme Court, which sort of inadvertently uh, raises a question of are there issues that we can and can't look at in, in camera? Uh, real quickly, on uh, in the VU case, uh, that talks about extending the time to uh, issue a final determination. Um, Section 1101B1 says, you know, OOR or any appeals officer has 30 days to issue a final determination, unless the excuse me, unless the requester agrees to uh, to extend that. As we saw earlier, you know, we did stay the appeal in, in the McKelvey case, but here we didn't stay the appeal. And an inmate asked for additional time to submit evidence, and we said, you know, we don't have time, you know, we've got 30 days, you know, so we're going to issue our, our final determination. And on appeal to the, to, to the Commonwealth Court, the, the inmate said, you know, I, I implicitly gave them extra time to issue a final determination by asking for time to, to, uh, to make a submission. And the court said, you know, that, that wasn't good enough. The court said, you know, if you want to waive your right to have a final determination in 30 days, you've got to do it expressly. And the, and the court was not going to find, you know, an implied waiver, you know, in, in the VU case. Uh, Brown versus Department of Health. Uh, this involves whether an agency has an obligation to ensure receipt of the records, and under the facts of this case, you know the answer is no. Uh, you know here we had an inmate who uh, made a request to Health. You know Health granted access, made the copies, mailed the copies to to where the inmate said mail them, uh, charged them the, the the fees, and the inmate challenged the fees, saying you know they charged me for 43 pages, I only got three. And we, uh, you know, took evidence, and the department said we identified a record. The record was 43 pages. We copied all 43 pages. We mailed all 43 pages, and uh, that's it. And we said, well, that's good enough. And when it went up to Commonwealth Court, the Commonwealth Court looked at the same evidence, and they also noted, as we noted, that you know, if there's evidence that something was properly mailed, there's a legal presumption that it was actually received. And so they, they found that you know, an agency only has an obligation to mail it. They don't have to obligation to ensure actual receipt. This case is kind of, I think, kind of an outlier because the guy was an inmate, and so I'm pretty sure that 43 pages were mailed, but um, DOC took 40 of them. So, but uh, any any event, uh, the the takeaways as an agency, you don't have to uh, you don't have to ensure receipt. So those are the cases that we've seen over the past year. Going forward, there are just a couple of cases that you know I think you should be on the lookout for. Uh, the first is the Uniontown Newspapers case, and that is a fee case. There, the Commonwealth Court slapped a $118,000 penalty against the Department of Corrections in an enforcement action, uh, concluding that uh, they didn't make a good faith effort to search for records when they were ordered to do so by you know by the court. Um, after the newspaper brought a uh, an enforcement action, uh, DOC uh, filed a petition for allowance of appeal with the court, which the court uh, agreed to take. Uh, and they the questions they are going to be considering is uh, can a court award bad faith fees where the open records officer failed to personally search for records, but instead re 
relied on, on other agency employees in, as part of a search, and whether a court can award sanctions where there's no fine, uh, when it's not related to a final determination or it doesn't reverse a final determination. I think basically, you know, can they award sanctions in an enforcement action as opposed to, you know, appeal the final determination? Um, this case isn't even in the briefing stage, so uh, probably not this coming year, maybe, maybe the following year. Uh, the next two cases, uh, Miller and Fox 43, I talked about these real briefly when I was discussing the Rodriguez case. Um, these cases both involved a request for a school bus video uh, of an adult uh, roughing up a student. You know, one was a teacher um, roughing up a student, and the other was... Uh, I believe it was a parent. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure exactly. She had an, another relationship with the uh, association with, with the school district, but it was a parent. Apparently, I guess there was an altercation with the girls' basketball team. Uh, they denied uh, the agencies denied it under FERPA. It came to us. We said, you know, it's not not an education record. You know, we went through the uh, criminal the, the non criminal investigative exemption. We said no. Uh, Miller, the Supreme Court has taken Alicotter on the issue simply whether the school bus video is is uh, you know is subject to FERPA. Uh, they've uh, held uh, 43 News in abeyance pending Miller. So I guess you know pretty much what happens in Miller is going to be what what happens in in Fox 40 Fox 43. Um, there was oral argument on that in September, so there will you know, most likely be a de you know, decision in, in the up upcoming year. Uh, the next case is uh, State Police v versus the ACLU. Uh, this is the case I was talking about in, in camera. There, there was a request for the State Police's uh, social media monitoring policy, and they withheld it, saying that disclosure would, uh, would threaten a law enforcement activity. We ordered in camera review, and the State Police gave us the record. We, we looked at the record, and we, you know, I don't know if we granted it in part or denied it in part, but you know, we definitely said some of this is, is subject to this disclosure. It's not meeting the, the security exemption. Uh, went up to Commonwealth Court. Uh, the Commonwealth Court uh, reversed us, uh, but they didn't look at the record itself. They relied solely on the uh, the affidavit of the state police's director of uh, criminal investigation. And there's a sentence in the court's opinion, which, if you're a very aggressive lawyer, can be read for the proposition that in camera review is you know, is, is not warranted or not appropriate when evaluating a security exemption. You know, we looked at this sentence and, you know, we didn't think that that's what the court, you know, what, what the court meant. But, you know, I can see where somebody, you know, you know, if I were an aggressive lawyer, I would certainly point to that sentence and, and say, you know, look at this sentence. So the, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the Supreme Court is a uh, is taking this case up. And that's one of the questions they're going to consider is whether it's inappropriate to order in camera review, whereas for reasons other than attorney client privilege or, uh, or uh, the internal uh, pre decisional deliberation ex exemption. Um, they are also going to be uh, considering where the Commonwealth Court erred in not looking at the records um, when we looked at them. And I guess the last question they're going to be considering is, is whether, uh, it, is whether the, the evidence was sufficient. Uh, uh, just a couple more cases, then I'm done. Uh, Liquor Control Board versus Burns. This is an interesting case. Uh, Representative Burns uh, asked for uh, the number of restaurant liquor license, licenses which are available for auction in each individual county. Uh, the Liquor Control Board said uh, the Liquor Control Board, the, the code makes it confidential. Uh, they said it was you know, internal pre decisional deliberation. And again, this is the number of licenses available. They also said it was, it was a trade secret. Uh, we overruled it on each basis, and it's now up in front of the Commonwealth Court. Uh, the briefing uh, schedule is underway, and the way you know, the Commonwealth Court works, they move pretty quickly. So you know, once briefs are, are, are you know, scheduled, so there should be a decision in not too distant future. Uh, I think this case is kind of interesting because the government is essentially arguing that um, information is a trade secret in an industry that they have an exclusive monopoly on. So, for what that's worth. And the last two cases are a couple of uh, common pleas cases. One's uh, Carbon County, the other's Adams. 
And the, both of these agencies fully participated before the Office of Open Records. They had, you know, submitted evidence, legal argument, you know, the whole nine yards. And they filed their appeal, um, as is their right, and we, we certainly expected them to. But they've also challenged uh, the right to know law and the Office of Open Records on due process grounds, you know, stating that uh, we violated their rights to due process. And, uh, so, you know, that sort of got our attention. And so we have, uh, you know, we have filed a brief in uh, Lee Heighton, um, and that's going to be decided on the briefs with, uh, at some point. And we have a brief that is teed up to be filed uh, before the end of this month in the County of Adams case. So you know, those are a couple of interesting cases. Um, if they don't go you know, our way, I'm sure, I'm sure they will find their way up to the Commonwealth Court. But that, those are the cases that I see uh, you know, coming up on the, uh, the, you know, on the horizon. And uh, with that, I will turn it over that way. Okay. Well, good afternoon. I am Deline, and I feel like everyone in the room needs a seventh inning stretch. <laughs> Just looking at everyone in the audience is kind of, you made it to this point. Everyone that is lucky enough to be at home or in your offices, you can move around as much as you want. But us in this room, my watch told me to get up twice and also to breathe. So <laughs> I just feel you've reached the exciting portion of our training, which is on regulations and IT. So <laughs> you're like, oh boy, right? So just a brief update on the regs. Um, the OR is promulgating regulations. We spoke about this last year. We now have our finalized uh, draft version ready to go. And that updated version is going to be on the website. So if you go on our website and look at the regulations, we have a tab. You can click on that. And within the next month, those ones that are, are there currently will be replaced. Uh, and those are the ones that we're actually using for our proposed rulemaking. Also underneath that regs tab, there's an overview of the entire process. So you can actually go on and look and see the proposed rulemaking stages and then the final rulemaking. So we have two rounds to go through. Um, we will be sending our packet, our regulatory analysis packet, over to the Office of the Budget to get our fiscal note and also to the Attorney General's office for um, their rule on form and legality for us. And then after that point, we will be sending it to our legislative committees, which is the state government committees. Um, we'll send it to the Legislative Reference Bureau, um, IRC, the Inter uh, Internal Regulatory Review Commission will get a hold of it. And we will also have public comments. So during both rounds, both during the proposed and the final rulemaking, everyone will have an opportunity to weigh in on the regs. Um, and we will respond to those comments. In the interim, once the new regulations go up, and if you have you know, a question, a comment that you would like to send us in the office, we always welcome um, you to do that. So you always have input into this process. So like I said, we're in the proposed rulemaking, um, and we will update where we are at on that tab if anybody is really seriously interested in our regulatory process. And I said, we always um, welcome questions. So you can always email, call me, and I'm happy to have a discussion with you on our regulations. So the IT portion. We um, have been working the last two years, uh, Eric had mentioned this in his initial welcoming, um, with the legislative um, LDPC <laughs> is, the, is the acronym. And they have been working with us on creating an appeals portal. And this appeals portal is going to, af is going to affect um, requesters, so the general public, and is also going to affect agencies. So what this is going to do is it is uh, an online docketing system. Also, it's a record management system. And it is designed to streamline and automate the appeals process. So appeals filed through this system will be available and accessible in real time for both the requester, the agency, and the appeals officer. And submissions will be made through this portal. Um, it's very similar to if um, an attorney has used the PAC file system with um, either the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Commonwealth, Superior, and some courts of common pleas also participate in PAC file. Our system has been designed so it's, it's very easy, it's simple. 
Uh, everyone will be able to access it. You don't have to have a law degree to use it because many of the people in front of our office are not represented by counsel. You know, they go through the appeals process just as individual citizens. So we kept that in mind as we developed this system. Um, there's no fees associated with it. Um, it is in the test phase right now. It is in the test phase, so it's not available at this moment, but we are starting, we want to make people aware that this is going to be happening. Um, and we were lucky enough that the governor's office gracious, graciously agreed to allow us to use a test agency. So that test agency will actually, any appeals to that agency uh, will be starting to use the portal. So if you have a requester and have an appeal with a Commonwealth agency, that is the test agency, you'll get notification, you'll have access to this portal. We asked to do that uh, simply to be able to work the bugs out of the system. You know, you worked on something for so long, you try to develop it, you know, with every possibility in mind, and then, you know, one thing happens, someone asks a question, we're like, oh, yeah, what about this? So we are, we are being very cautious with this. Um, and let me assure you that you can still use the appeal process how it happens now. It's still gonna be available, you know, for a very, very long time. We're gonna make a gradual uh, shift to this. And also, there's certain instances where people don't have access. We get a lot of appeals, you know, they're handwritten, they're sent through the mail. We still will process those appeals. So there's never gonna be an end to that phase, but those that are able to access um, our system electronically, it'll, it'll just make it a nice, fast, smooth way to be able to do that. So when you go on our website right now, you can file, a, a, there's an appeals tab at the top. And you just click on that, and this is how you do it now. This is how you, you the same way. I just wanna go to the next slide, there we go. Okay, the same way you do it now, this is the form that comes up. Oh, and by the way, this PowerPoint's gonna be on our, our website too. So you'll be able to, to, to get this PowerPoint um, at the end of this presentation, um, those who want to view this, because I know it's kind of hard to see this. But you just go online, you put your information on, you, you know, you can, there's drop down menus that you can file, you know, um, the exemptions, the agency information, you put your information in, all that, you submit it at this time. And that triggers our administrative officers to issue your appeal packet. Under the portal, what will happen, it will still go into a holding area, which it does now. We'll look at it to make sure there's no deficiencies, you're not missing something in your appeal, and then you'll be granted portal access. So you'll basically receive an email that says portal access is granted, and it's going to have an email for you and a password. We made the password as easy as we can. You can set up your own password then. You can change the password as many times as you want. All that's developed into the system. Um, so we didn't want to have a system where someone forgets their password and then they call us and, and we have to reset it. You can actually reset it on your own with the information that we provide. So you'll, and you'll get an email. You've been granted access to the portal. What will happen is, the agency will then get access to the portal at that time as well. So the agency is going to be like, hey, you had an appeal filed against you. Here's your portal access. They'll be able to go in and see the appeal at that time. Now, if you want to go and access the portal, there will be a tab. It's our Twitter page tab right now on our website. But it will look like this, and it will say appeal portal. You click on it, you enter your information, and you can access your appeals at any time. You'll log on. You'll have a portal log on, your email, your password. There's a three set password. All that will come up automatically. What the portal will allow you to do is it's going to give uh, party information. Now, this is only accessible to the parties in the appeal. So it'll be the agency, the requester. If you have attorneys, that information you will be able to add in. They will have access to this as well. 
um, but it'll it'll list everything. Uh, you know, you're going to have, and it's this, like I said, this isn't available to the public. This is through the appeals process. So the agency information is going to be there. The attorney information is going to be there. All that will be accessible to you. You're also going to have a list of all your appeals. So we have people that have multiple appeals in front of our agency. Um, you know, if you have 10 appeals, all 10 of those will be listed that you have been granted access to. Um, and so for me, I feel that uh, it makes a really great record management because it gets confusing. I mean, you know, I have conversations all the time with people that have like multiple appeals and things start to get confusing. Even if you have different appeals officers assigned to your cases, which is quite often the case, you'll still be able to see your list of appeals and who the, the parties are. You just click on them and um, all active appeals will be there for you to access. You'll be able to submit files through the appeal. So it'll have a description. There's drop down menus for each of these things. And these are the kind of things that we want to work out for the test phase, because maybe we missed some submissions and types of files. Uh, we tried to cover everything, but you'll be able to have a description. You'll be able to have a submission type. And you'll submit it. And it'll go automatically to all the parties and the appeals officer. So they will get a notification that there has been a file submitted in this appeal and that you can log into the portal to access it. So like request or correspondence, the submission type, the file. Um, you'll be able to add all this. You'll also be able to put a text message in. If you want, don't have a file to actually submit, but you want to type something out, there'll be a box for that that you will be able to do as well. And all the parties will receive that information as a submission. And then you will get, like I said, the new file notification. New files have been added to your Office of Open Records portal for the following dockets. It'll bring up the docket number that you are associated with. And it will also have the portal login right there. You'll just be able to click to log into your portal and see those, those files. Direct interest participants. Um, you know, sometimes we have third parties involved in our appeals. So we have a section that you can, or the appeals officer can determine that a third party has to be included in this appeal process. So what will happen is this form will be filled out. It will be given to those individuals that are considered third parties. They will fill out this information. It'll be submitted. It'll go into the holding area. The appeals officer will look at that and determine if that party has standing in this case and either grant or deny it. Uh, you know, once they are added, if they are granted, it, and people will receive this message, you know, a, a, a direct interest participant request has been received, and then they will receive the letter. This determining that, yes, you've been granted party access to this case. Here is your portal information. And then when you go in and it lists all the parties at the beginning for that case, it'll list those direct interest participants as well. So you'll be able to see all that information. And they will be able to make submissions just like every other party um, will be able to do on the portal. It also creates a docket sheet, um, which is really interesting. So each case has a docket sheet. You'll be able to click on the docket sheet just like you would at PAC file, just like you would at the court. You can go online to see your docket sheet. Um, it gives you a description. It tells you your appeals officer. It tells you what agency. So if it's a county, it'll come up, you know, the county. If it's a Commonwealth agency, it'll list, you know, Department of Transportation, Education, whatever agency it is. Uh, it'll list all the legal issues. It'll list the stage that your appeal is at. And it will also list um, a description of what has been filed. And you can click on those and bring up a PDF of the records that have been filed. We turn this whole docket sheet at the end once a final determination has been issued through the portal. It actually turns into a PDF. So we did this um, so you can actually access and have a PDF of your actual docket. But also for our office, we file a certified record. Uh, when our final determinations are appealed. So once we get notice of an appeal, we file a certified record with the Court of Common Pleas, Commonwealth Court, whatever court that gives us a notice of an appeal. 
and it's a timely process. This, we can go in, we can hit the button, turn it into PDF, and create a certified record of everything that can be sent out um, to the court. So we do about 120 certified records a year. Um, that's going to be increasing um, just because of the amount of appeals that we have been handling and have been appealed to the other courts and the Court of Common Pleas is a huge amount of those records. So I feel like the timeliness and um, the ability to be able to do that is going to be really um, a nice feature of this portal. So test agency, um, we're going to be test, we're going to be training internally um, probably in December um, and then test agency January and then we're hoping to roll this out in April. Um, so Hopefully we don't have a lot of bugs, <laughs> depending on the bugs. And, you know, um, to be honest with you, we are always interested in feedback. Um, and this is a big step for us, you know. So we appreciate any feedback, any comments um, that you want to provide as you start to see this process unfolding. And we are going to be have training. So there will be training materials online. I'm sure George will be including in his training program. We'll be having a webinar, I'm sure. Um, so there's going to be plenty of rollout and time for you to make comments uh, on this system. So it's really exciting, and that's all I really have. And there's the boss. <laughs> so thank you. Good timing. I'm trying to trick people into thinking that we uh, practiced that. Um, all right. Thank you all very much. Uh, a couple of uh, quick reminders. The PowerPoint, uh, as uh, Delene mentioned, uh, is on our website. Anybody can download it from there. Don't forget your CLE forms if you're an attorney. Again, if you're watching on the webinar, a link will be emailed to you. Uh, right around 4 o'clock. And also, we have a ton of great questions, which is fantastic. If we don't answer your question here uh, and you send it in by email, somebody will get back to you uh, as soon as possible, either tomorrow or early next week. If you submitted it on an index card and we don't get back to you, uh, please send it to us by email or give us a call and uh, we'll handle it that way. All right. Um, one of the most popular questions we get, George. I'll start with an easy one for you. Uh, when a right to know request is received, the five business day response time, does that include the date of receipt? How is that five day period calculated? Uh, it does not. If you were to receive a right to know request today, your first full business day would be tomorrow, assuming that you're open for business. All right. Um, recordings. Uh, the public can record a public meeting unannounced, as mentioned earlier. Uh, does the board need to announce if they are recording the meeting? Uh, I'm not aware of any requirement that they need to do so, although I think it would be a best practice uh, for the president of the board to announce that they are, in fact, recording the meeting. Uh, on the Sunshine Act, uh, referencing the Sunshine Act, do the terms board and city council mean the same thing in terms of how the rules are applied, or is there any distinction between a city council and a board, that kind of thing? Alex, am I getting points with these, this rapid fire? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that's for me, and uh, there is no distinction. All right. Uh, record retention. Does deletion of a record that is subject to the Historical Museum Commission's record retention schedule before that schedule says the record could be deleted, uh, does that kind of a deletion subject a municipality to penalties for bad faith? I'm not aware of any instances where it would. Uh, the retention schedule that's put forth by the Museum Commission, which I recommend all mun local municipalities take a look at, I think that only carries force of law if they choose to adopt it as their municipality's official retention policy. And then, uh, e even then, I'm not aware of any sanctions that are attached to that policy, but I, I would suggest contacting the Museum Commission for clarification. And I would also add that the uh, record retention laws in Pennsylvania, uh, there are some very good ones, but uh, they were all written long before uh, today's era where we have mostly computerized records. So it's a, uh, um, would be a good time for somebody to uh, uh, really 
dig into that and, and truly what more exciting issue could there be for as somebody who used to work for the state senate I know that uh, just about every state senator is is really itching for an, an issue like that to dig into. Um, must an agency adopt the OOR's fee schedule by policy or resolution in order to charge those fees? No. Very simple. You are, uh, uh, you are going to get bonus points here, George. All right. Uh, social media. Are public comments made to an agency posting on social media considered public records or uh, and I'm not sure this is really an either or question, but it's, it's phrased that way. Or can such social media commentary by members of the public be deleted on a monthly basis per policy? So it sounds like they might have a record retention policy in place that specifically addresses okay. social media. I, I think I understand the context of the question. And it's going to come down to is, is the agency in possession of the comment? Meaning, is it an agency administered page? If so, then any comments posted to that page by members of the public would be considered a part of that public record and subject to disclosure under right to know. The nice thing is that the page is already in the public domain. So it's simply a matter of pointing the request to the appropriate URL where they would access all that material. As far as uh, scrubbing the page periodically, uh, I'm not aware of any prohibition with that, just as we found in our own uh, review of social media. Uh, you might think you're deleting it, uh, but it's still there. And if you can access it uh, without any outside forensic expertise, you would be expected to produce those otherwise deleted messages in response to a right to know request for them. All right, Deline, a couple of questions about the portal. Uh, how will the appeal portal work for inmate appeals under the right to know law? Right, and, and that is an example of one where we would have to do it the, the old fashioned way where everything is submitted you know, through the mail. Um, so that's why we, have, we will continue to offer that way to file appeals. And uh, as a right to know officer, I will be able to access my portal but to loop in city solicitors, for example, would I need to manually grant them access on a per appeal basis, or will I be able to add them sort of one time and so they can have access to all subsequent appeals involving that city? Right, it, it'll, be, um, it'll be just like it is now when we have a drop down menu for open records officers, they'll have a list. Um, so if there's a solicitor associated with it, like at, with the eight Commonwealth agencies, they call them records legal liaisons, so it's the attorney, they would also be part of that uh, portal information, yes. We can put, uh, I believe we can add, um, there's a specific number of parties I think that we can add for each side, and then we have to actually get a different access, but yes, yeah. And a good point, I know Deline mentioned this, but a good time to remind folks if you have any suggestions for a portal like this uh, as we're developing it, please feel free to contact us and let us know. A lot of people uh, who are uh, attending here and watching on the webinar have experience with similar types of portals. We'd love to hear what you like about portals like that that you use, what you don't like, what you'd like to see us do better, uh, anything along those lines. Um, for, for anybody, can an open records officer require an elected official or an agency employee to sign an affidavit attesting to the non-existence of records? Uh, for example, if there are emails that qualify as records, but they're on a personal email account uh, that the open records officer can't access or potentially could be on an email account like that, can the, can the arrow require the employee or the official to sign an affidavit saying they would they don't exist. That's a uh, organizational question for the specific uh, entity in terms of who, who is the arrow. I know uh, school districts, uh, the open records officer tends to be the superintendent. Um, so the superintendent, uh, I think, sort of has a lot of leverage over you. Um, some agencies, the open records officer. Um, 
doesn't have that, um, that much power. But certainly, uh, if you're saying the records don't exist when it comes to us, uh, at some point, in order to meet your burden of proof, you're going to need to produce an affidavit. Uh, I will say that uh, some Commonwealth agencies, they will produce an affidavit with the, uh, with the response, which they simply submit to us when the appeal comes in, and we'll accept that affidavit unless there's you know, some reason we might think that circumstances have changed such that uh, you know, the, the, the affidavit doesn't carry as much weight. Uh, administrative law judge offices, are they considered judicial agencies under the right to know law? I, uh, I think they are part of uh, an, executive, uh, right. ex an executive agency. So uh, in, like the they're not part of the unified judicial system, right. let's put it that way, which, would, which is really the determinative as to what is a judicial agency. If a board member, without the authority of the agency, uh, releases exempt information to the public, such as personal identification information, is there any recourse that the agency can take against that board member? Mm -hmm. And what about the individual whose information was released? Do they have any recourse in a situation like that? To the extent they may have suffered damages as a result of, of the release of that information, um, you mentioned personal information, which is, I think, you know, sort of a different uh, um, puts a little uh, you know qualifier on it. Um, the right to know law is not a confidentiality statute in and of itself. So if, if it's if it were information other than you know personal information, I don't think there would be as much of a uh, as much of a sanction as opposed to uh, something where somebody might be able to um, you know, steal your identity right. and there, there you have, you know, you have damages which you could say, you know, because of you, you know, I'm out of money. And I think we need to clarify that that question is in the context of a right to know request, not just a public official releasing information that they otherwise wouldn't be inclined to. Um, in matters, uh, continuing the personal information theme, in matters where personal information in agency records have been redacted or withheld, and there's a subsequent appeal, how can the person whose information is at issue participate before the OOR as an interested third party without having to give up their personal information, their home address, their telephone number, et cetera, uh, for docketing? I think we've had uh, people participate using uh, using an email and not including uh, their safe their home address, um, something that allows us to to communicate with them. Right, as long as we have an ability to communicate right. with them and and uh, uh, throughout the appeal, that's the real yeah. right. right key. Um, is an agency required to provide? So if, if a request is submitted and the agency's response is those records do not exist, we don't have those records, is that agency required to provide information about which agency might have the records if they're denying a request along those lines? So that's something that I know the OOR does routinely. We get a thousand, roughly, and it's pretty consistent, uh, about a thousand misdirected requests every year. And we do that pretty routinely. We try to say, we don't have those records. You probably want to contact whoever it is. But it's it is, courtesy. it's a courtesy, right? It, so there's no requirement that an agency do that. The OOR does it as a courtesy. Uh, it's a good practice if the agency knows that kind of information to do it. But the law doesn't require it. Charles, um, regarding uh, a, a case, Warren versus the State Ethics Commission, so if a record is found after the requester has passed the deadline to appeal to the OOR, can they still do that instead of going to the court? Is there any situation in that sort of uh, a construct where the, the appeal deadline can be overlooked? You know, I, I think from, you, you could probably make an argument that Bu the Buell case might allow you to say that uh, that you didn't know of your, you know, the uh, the cause of action, your right, you know, your, the ability to appeal and what you're appealing, until uh, the records were found. Uh, you could also simply uh, make another request for records. But I, I would, I mean, I would take a stab using the Buell case. A uh, couple of questions uh, back to recording of public meetings. If a school district has a school director who has been recording board meetings during that director's tenure on the board. Uh, and say that director's term ends 
next month in December, uh, is the school director obligated to give the district those recordings? Does the school district have any obligation to try and obtain those recordings to maintain them in the event that there's a future right to know request? Uh, no, they would not. And I believe it was the Wyrick case uh, from several years ago where a, uh, a township supervisor went off the board but took some records with him. And when he left the board, they, those records were no longer considered public and the uh, township no longer had an obligation to retrieve them. And as I recall, just to flesh that out a little bit, I think in that case they were, they were, they were records. They were records of the agency, but they were also, it, was, it wasn't like he uh, uh, took a yeah. filing cabinet with him. Right. They, were, they were also his records right. in some way. Yeah. Um, so don't take filing cabinets. <laughs> What's a filing cabinet? <laughs> What's a filing cabinet? Um, after a school board meeting has been adjourned, if the school board solicitor then has a discussion uh, between two people in the room, not clear from this whether it's school directors or not, um, but the, the board solicitor is recording a discussion after a school board meeting has been adjourned, is that recording something that can be requested via the right to know law? And the answer is yes, it can be requested, but we'll get to the, <laughs> we'll get to the issue of do you have any chance of getting it or not? I think the question is whether it documents the transaction or activity of the agency. What, right. what are they talking about? Right, it's all about the content, which right. is what it always case comes back to. What's that? It's case by case, right? Case by yes. case, it's exactly, exactly. Um, on the issue of speaking, uh, of the public speaking at a meeting, uh, George, I think it was you stated that the board can limit the comments to residents and taxpayers. If you're at a school board meeting and a person stands up and says they are a Pennsylvania taxpayer and points out that the school district accepts state subsidies, how does that work? Good luck. Um, I don't think they would qualify as a local resident. No. Nonprofits, are all 501c3 nonprofits subject to right to know requests for financial records? Again, it goes back to whether or not they're considered a similar governmental entity. I think probably as a general rule, a private nonprofit corporation is not going to be subject unless there's some evidence of government control of that entity. So I, you know, the government doesn't control a lot of nonprofit uh, entities. So I think as a, as a general rule, as a presumption, I would, I would say no. I think that the problem is we always see requests going to, to, you know, to nonprofits. And uh, if there's some evidence that we can determine that they are a nonprofit without having to make them waste money, you know, we try to do that because you know, obviously you know, somebody has to say I'm not an agency and this is why I'm not an agency. Um, so, um, Meeting minutes. Uh, do meeting minutes need to be available to the public? And if so, is there any specific requirement as to how they are to be made available? For example, uh, the board here had a link to past minutes on its website but it could only be accessed with registration and a password. All the Sunshine Act says, I think the term is, or the phrase is that meet, meeting minutes must be kept. And I think that there are, depending on the borough code or township codes or whatever, it may get more specific as to how those minutes are kept. Um, but when it comes to the Sunshine Act, there's just not a lot of guidance. Right, meeting minutes are to be kept, meeting minutes are public, but that's about the extent of it. Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I haven't researched it, but I think that uh, uh, ma an actual physical uh, minutes book uh, is required in certain situations, but I, I would need to research it and find exactly what I think those. Minimum, irrespective of whether or not it's behind a paywall, if somebody asks for the records, yeah. you know, they're entitled to the records. Right. And I know George, in his training, and when I go out and do training, we routinely recommend to agencies to put your meeting minutes up on a website. They're yeah. very fundamentally public records. They are requested quite often. There is no reason not to be doing that, assuming you have the, the technica technological capability to, to do it, which is a pretty minimal uh, uh, need. Um, third party wages. We have an open records request for employee names and salaries, but the request also includes subcontractors. 
we pay a bus contractor through a contract. There's a payment formula based on mileage. And then our board approves a list of drivers, and we can provide the names of those drivers. However, do we need to provide the wages of the drivers from the third party, the bus contractor? They don't pay those wages. They pay the contract formula. I, th I think you know, certainly the, 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 the cost of, that of the government from the contractor is public. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of a you know, case by case as to whether or not the costs of a subcontractor to the contractor are public. Uh, there is case law which says the contractor's costs in performing the government contract aren't directly related to the government contract. And there are cases which, which have held where the government is involved in you know, those costs, you know, they may be, may be directly related. Uh, back to public meetings. If the public is given the agenda with all the action items prior to the meeting, can the public comment period be held prior to the action item being publicly discussed? The comment period is at the beginning of the meeting, in other words, not at the end. Well, the law requires that the public be afforded the opportunity to comment before any decision is made, meaning before a vote. So as long as um, the agency has met its obligation there, I think uh, the law is satisfied. Yeah, I think that the, the way the question's laid out, it's actually a very good scenario. Give the public the agenda up front, make public comment one of the first things, and then move on with the agenda uh, after that. Um, government function as it relates to third-party contracts. When an agency contracts with a third party to perform a service not directly relating to the core function of that agency, mm -hmm. For example, you've got a contract with a cleaning company to provide cleaning services for the office that the agency occupies. What is the criteria to determine whether the contractor is performing a governmental function? I think that you know the case law says you know non ancillary services, but I, I think the you know, I, I like your phrase core function of, of the agency. You know, the I mean the well, let's say it's you know the you know, the Department of Corrections. You know the Department of Corrections is the business of housing inmates. You know not necessarily you know, maybe 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 housing clean. Maybe that's not the right analogy. Um, I don't think you know clean you know clean, cleaning the office you know I don't think is a core function of uh, of most governmental agencies you know they're they're performing something else um, other than keeping their offices clean. I've been to a lot of government offices and cleaning the office is clearly not a core function <laughs> of of government offices by and large. Um, Right. Oh, clearly the contract with the, with the cleaning company would be a public record. Right. I think the question relates to how much further does it go beyond that, very similar to the bus example. Yes, good clarification. Thank you. Um, uh, regarding fee waivers, can an agency ignore a public interest fee waiver request, or can they simply ignore it, or do they have to have a reason for such a denial? In other words, are there any factors that are used to determine whether a requester is entitled to a public interest fee waiver, or is it completely discretionary? Agency discretion. Yeah, it's discretionary. I mean, there may be something that goes into it. I mean, certainly you can't say, I'm not going to give you a fee waiver because you're a member of a protected class, um, but uh, we really don't have the, the, you know, the, the authority to get into matters of discretion. That's right. really reserved for the, uh, for the courts. Um, a couple of questions from the requester perspective. Uh, agencies sometimes deny a request because the information requested is not readily available, claiming that it is having to create a record to retrieve and compile the information. The example given here is uh, detainer requests are in an inmate's individual file, so the agency would have to go retrieve the file to give me a copy of the detainer. How do Pennsylvanians access this data uh, or these records under the right to know law. I think that ties into uh, sort of the Laguerre construct, Charles. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they've got, to, they've got to go into the inmates file and get it. Right. Yeah, in that specific example, uh, uh, it's, it's really in line with uh, Laguerre versus DEP. Right. Um, existence of records. Uh, agencies sometimes deny requests because the specific information requested in a specific format is not readily available or does not exist, but very related information does exist. 
Can agencies in their denial explain what related information does exist, point the requester in the right direction, uh, or are they able essentially to not do that and just say, no, what you requested doesn't exist? I think it's best practice to say this is what we have and this, this you know, should satisfy your, you know, your, your needs, even and, if it doesn't exist. Right. Right, and that's a, a, an issue we see a, a, a lot. And uh, there are a lot of agencies, uh, I think generally speaking, the state agencies do a very good job of this, uh, and a lot of local agencies, but not all of them, uh, doing that kind of thing. And uh, it's not something that they would be required to do, but it's certainly something that we in our training encourage them to do. And if they don't, depending on the specific facts, they could be dancing toward a bad faith right. kind of determination down the line. And, and also, I see a lot of that issue in mediation. You know, they, they're looking for a certain record, the agency doesn't have it, but they're like, oh, but the requester is like, but I think I want this, and they clarify in mediation, and the agency's like, oh, yeah, we have that. Right. You know, we didn't know that's what you were searching for. That's so that happens point. a yeah. lot. Yeah. <laughs> I think the standard is, can the agency provide records that are responsive to the request? It may not be exactly what the person is asking for, right. nevertheless, they are responsive, so the agency has an obligation at, at the least to let the requester know that these records are available. A uh, question about amending the right to know law. Um, I was wondering if there's any progress on amending the law to not allow it to be used for solicitation and commercial purposes. We receive monthly requests along those lines. Uh, the short answer is yes. There is a House bill um, sponsored by Representative Justin Simmons uh, that is advancing through the House uh, on that specific issue. There's also legislation pending in the Senate that includes that and a number of other issues. Um, but the um, um, the forward progress on that bill during the current session, uh, it's gotten further than it has previously, so uh, I'm optimistic that that kind of bill can make its way to the governor's desk uh, this session. George, back to meeting agendas, popular topic today. Poor George. We post our board agenda on the website before the meeting. Are we required to post all of the attachments that pertain to the agenda? No, the, the law is silent on agendas, but you know, our position, our recommendation would be the more information you can get out there ahead of time to benefit the public's participation in your meeting, the better. It's like board packets. Exactly, board mm -hmm. packets. Uh, and again, just to emphasize what George said, that's, that's what we encourage agencies to do every time we get that question. Um, to what extent is an arrow liable for not finding records if they are relying on other agency employees to provide them from a location that is remote and unfamiliar to the arrow. I think that's the, uh, the Uniontown newspapers case. You know, the Supreme Court's going to consider it. And But to, to amplify that a bit, I think you're saying that the Supreme Court will consider uh, or the courts will consider all of those factors, right, right, right. Um, uh, whether the arrow should have known, whether the arrow was legitimately and, relying and on and another and I person. And I think what, what the you know what, what the law requires is that a good faith effort be made, you know, to locate the records. Um, petitions for reconsideration. When will the OOR entertain a a petition? Pardon me, a petition for reconsideration of an OOR final determination. I'm thinking that means under what circumstances do we do We, we entertain, we entertain uh, petitions for reconsideration for every single case, you know, under all circumstances. We may or may not, you know, we may not grant it, but every single petition, you know, we analyze and, uh, and we come to a de uh, determination or decision as to whether or not uh, reconsideration is warranted. Um, issues which may warrant reconsideration, uh, you know, was there an error of law in the final determination? Uh, did we, you know, you know not uh, consider uh, a specific piece of evidence? Uh, there may have been a piece of evidence which, uh, you know, was submitted, which you know the open records officer, you know, officer missed, and so somebody says, "Hey, this is an evidence, and you know, th this should have been should have been considered." Um, but uh, we we analyze each uh, each request for reconsideration, and you don't have to say the magic words reconsideration if if we think that you're, you know, questioning the uh, the, the wisdom of the final determination. We'll let you know that we're treating it as a petition for reconsideration, and we'll we'll you know advise you accordingly whether or not it's granted. Uh, this uh, involves um, uh, a township manager um, contacting supervisors. As the township manager, would it be okay for me to call supervisors individually 
and explain a situation and offer each of them individually my input and suggested way of proceeding? I think that's fact gathering. Yeah, it's going to depend it's close. on the specific right. conversation. Yes. I would exercise caution uh, yeah. because you could be having a de facto uh, case of deliberation taking place when people start talking amongst themselves outside of the public eye. Yeah. Even though it's one-on-one -on -one conversations, when you add them all together, you've got deliberation and uh, you just want to be very careful. If a, uh, this goes back to personal information. If a right to know request is made for names of employees, job titles and salaries, all very clearly public information, and there is no specific record or report that provides just that information, can a record be altered so that it doesn't show any sensitive information? For example, you've got a record that shows that, plus birth dates and social security numbers. Can you delete the birth dates and social security numbers or redact them before yeah, providing The phrase is redaction. Yeah. You, know, you can redact. Uh, otherwise exempt or confidential information from a record which itself would otherwise be public if there's um, exempt information contained within a public record. All right. Um, home addresses on statements of financial interest. Uh, in a case earlier this year, the OOR found that the home addresses on statements of financial interest forms are public. This appears to be contrary to the Reese and PSEA cases which determined that whether something uh, is a constitutional issue is beyond the right to know law and a balancing test must be made. Uh, the Ethics Act makes the form public, but that law was written and later amended in the 1980s, well before a decision on the constitutionality of releasing home addresses was made. Uh, I looked up that case uh, earlier just to get a little more. Uh, it was, uh, it's Hughes versus Exeter Township as, as identified by the, uh, by the uh, individual here. Um, and in that case, essentially what we held was that when the General Assembly with very clear language said that statements of financial interest are public, uh, that the balancing test has already been done right. essentially uh, to, to summarize it. Um, and before any of you weigh in on it to answer, I will also say uh, that at least the current version of the Ethics Commission statement of financial interest is very clear. Uh, that a business or an office address or a government office address uh, can be used on it. It doesn't need to be a home address, so that's something to keep in mind. I think you. I think we hit the nail on the head. You answered I would it. Never disagree <laughs> with anything you said. Yeah, no, that's that is completely untrue, <laughs> and it should be untrue. Um, all right. Uh, personal information. Some more on that. We are a local municipality. We have a resident filing right to knows. Uh, for information on another resident uh, regarding uh, late payments on their sewer bills, trash bills, shutoff notices, real estate taxes, etc. Uh, the requester then posts this on their personal but public Facebook page, uh, potentially as an embarrassing tactic or a bullying tactic. Uh, does that information have to be released? Does the balancing test come into play in this situation? Uh, or not. So uh, sewer bills, trash bills, shut off notices, are those things typically public records or is this something that uh, uh, they should put some more thought into? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think we, we've, we've held that the home addresses, you know, of, of those bills are not subject to disclosure. But if this is a private individual obtaining, somehow obtaining this information and then posting it, is, is that the, the Obtaining scenario? it via the right to know law. Though. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, sounds like the uh, the agency in this case the, the handles the the sewer bills and right. the trash bills and that kind of thing. It's not a private provider situation. I, mean, I think you know. I think the the agency you know would have. It was incumbent on the agency to perform the balancing test um, to the you know before you know releasing that information, and to the extent they did, you know. Or to notify, right? Yeah. That, I mean, I don't know if they notified that party that their information was being requested. That's another problem. <laughs> Another step that could be yes. taken for sure and, yes, and something absolutely. to be considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Very good. Um, on exemptions, uh, agencies sometimes claim a record is subject to a particular exemption in the right to know law and they deny the record in its entirety instead of simply redacting the portions that fall under the exemption. Uh, can you talk about redaction uh, and when that's appropriate versus withholding an entire record? 
it's it's the nature of the record itself. If the if the record in its entirety, for example, you know, a police report relating to you know a criminal investigation, that entire record by its you know very nature um, is, uh, is is exempt from disclosure. So no individual portion of that record is going to be subject to redaction when the whole record is is in essence being redacted. If there is um, Let's say uh, you know some record which ha which is uh, meeting minutes for for example. Say there's you know some meeting minutes and somebody puts out you know their home address on it. That might be a situation. You know the minutes are clearly public. Um, you may get into a situation where you know redacting the home address is appropriate, or there may there, there might be a better example of, of of a record which is otherwise you know completely public. Uh, let's say a contract. Right. Um, where which has a uh, you know somebody's home address you know on it you know, the contract itself is public, but you know maybe subject to redaction under the uh, under the right to privacy. Um, and finally, final question for the day: uh, Agencies sometimes blanketly. I'm not, sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've ever heard the word blanket turned into an adverb, but I love it. Uh, agencies sometimes blanketly deny the request without explaining how the exemption applies. Is there any requirement for the agency to explain how an exemption applies instead of invoking the exemption without further explanation? Certainly, when they when it gets to the Office of Open right, Records, when they appeal right. it, yes, yeah. that's right. When that there happens. may not be any such requirement at the response to a request stage, uh, but if you get into a situation where where a denial like that has been appealed to the Office of Open Records, the agency is certainly going to be required to explain exactly how they're right. applying that exemption or and. Lose. and and what, or, or face not winning the appeal, losing the appeal, exactly right. Thank you all very much. Uh, we appreciate you, uh, you attending today. Um, this uh, entire uh, session will be available uh, on our website. Both uh, the PowerPoint is there now. Uh, the video will be there hopefully sometime uh, next week and on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you have any questions here in the room, feel free to come up and talk to us individually. Uh, again, thank you all very much. We appreciate your, uh, your joining us today.